Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free United Nations Coalition for Access. Uh, thanks a lot for the, for, the, for the briefing and events of this. I would wanted to ask, I'm sure you've thought about these. This is a, about critiques of the, of the Paris Agreement by, by people that think it should have gone further. Uh, some say, uh, you know, I'll just run them through them really fast, that, that under current commitments, the temperature would in fact rise by, by three degrees Celsius, that, there's re that, that of the $100 billion uh, uh, discussed, only $2 billion have been committed. I think maybe higher than that, but I'd like to know what your number is. Um, that, and I guess I'll, I'll cut to this one, that, that uh, aviation and shipping emissions are not sufficiently dealt with, even though they're expected to triple and quadruple by 2050. What would you say to this critique as we go into this week of, of signing? Uh, are these critiques well-founded? Are they not well-founded? And uh, if so, what, if, if they are founded, what will be do, done about them? Thanks. Um, one of the good things about the Paris Agreement and the outcomes in Paris is that there was an honest reflection on the part of parties that the current effort was insufficient and inconsistent with the below two degree objective. That was acknowledged in Paris. However, um, there was a commitment on the part of parties embedded in the Paris Agreement to increase the ambition level of current commitments to reduce emissions. The five-year review ratchet-up mechanism, that's an essential part of the Paris Agreement, was precisely designed to do that. Every five years, countries will reflect on how their collective effort um, match up against the below two degree objective. And that will inform future cycles of commitment. This was done on the insistence of the vulnerable countries who fought against locking in a low, the existing low level of ambition. That first moment of reflection will occur in 2018 um, where the entire international community will, will assess the collective effort of all countries in meeting the below, well below two degree objective. And this will inform countries' um, submission of their final national commitments to the Paris Agreement. And this will happen every five years until we're on that below two degree pathway. In terms of finance, I agree with you. Um, the 100 billion, um, it, it, it's, it's a lot more than 2 billion. It was a commitment made in 2009 to mobilize 100 billion from public and private sources. In the lead up to Paris, there was a report prepared by the OECD, which um, indicated that while significant progress was made towards mobilizing the 100 billion collectively by 2020, while this progress was made, a significant amount of work remained. I think the number identified by the, um, by the OECD report was, was around 62 billion per year. Um, however, um, countries are taking this seriously. But the Paris Agreement has sent a very clear signal to the um, real economy that the direction of travel is clear. So while 100 billion is an important number politically, it pales in comparison to the trillions that will be required to ensure that we are on a sustainable, low carbon, climate resilient pathway. And the Paris Agreement provides those signals to the real economy because it will be the real economy that will largely determine whether um, we stay below two degrees or not. And finally, in terms of all the, all the criticism, no international agreement is perfect. However, the fact that you have, you know, and I once sat as a negotiator for the small island developing states, and I know how frustrated they were and have been with the international process. Um, the mere fact that these countries are coming at the level of heads of state and government for the most part, over 75% of them are coming at that level. And that 10 of them are actually ratifying this Paris Agreement is a vote of confidence in the agreement from the most vulnerable. It's a vote of confidence from the most vulnerable. And while it's not a perfect agreement, it gives them hope, it gives them um, a real lifeline on survival. And the agreement, the proof of the, of the agreement will be in its implementation. 
David. And I'm just saying, uh, it gives the world hope. I mean, I think just the the way in which uh, heads of state and government are reacting is a suggestion that a situation which up till now really did look uh, extremely sad and caused a lot of despair has now got hope and a real sense that we can turn the corner. Thank you.